So as you've been hearing this morning from uh, Jerry Fishback and J Jeremy Vinster Vanderweel, of the many proposed causes of autism, what we know so far is the strongest evidence is genetic. Uh, as you've been hearing, there's probably, it's clearly not a single gene mutation that's responsible, uh, but many different genes, a hundred or more. And this is a, a short list of some of those genes that have been identified each in a few individuals with autism. So when you have this wealth of opportunities for genetic causes, how do you factor out which are the important genes, which contribute to which of the symptoms which may be less important? So in biomedical research, the standard in the field is to generate a mouse with the same mutation and then investigate the biology of that mouse to understand what the consequences of that mutation have been. And luckily, in the autism field, investigators have generated many mouse models with mutations in many of those genes. And in fact, some of them are comorbid with other disorders, such as Fragile X syndrome. And for example, the Shank 3 gene mutation is found in a syndrome called Phelan McDermott. So we've got this long list of mouse models that are out there and available for, to study. And the question then is, uh, why mice? The genetic technology has allowed researchers to place these mutations found in people with autism into the mouse genome. And it's really that uh, technology began first in mice. And it's now being done in rats and also in fish and other species. Uh, but we've got a lot of uh, numbers of models of mouse uh, genes invest to investigate in terms of autism. The question uh, is what why, what do mice have in common with people? And actually quite a lot. So mice and humans have similar biochemistry, physiology, brain anatomy, neurotransmitters, receptors, electrophysiology, and synapses. And mice and humans share a lot of genes. Uh, the mutations are most easily inserted into the mouse genome with some new technologies now coming along allowing us to expand. And there are social species. So how do you model the very human symptoms of autism in mice? So this was an, a big challenge that our lab took on about 15 years ago. We know for sure that this is a uniquely human disorder, and we never use this term. Nobody in the lab is allowed to say those two words together. Uh, we're looking for behaviors with conceptual analogies to similarities to the social deficits, repetitive behaviors, and other features of autism. And we use those to test hypotheses about the causes, uh, including uh, genetics, but also environmental causes, such as paternal age, autoantibodies, environmental toxins that have been proposed and are under investigation. And then the idea of these models is to be translational tools. If you've got a good, strong rationale for using that model and you've got good behaviors, you then can test drug treatments or other types of interventions, genetic interventions, to, for their ability to reverse those symptoms. So that's where we're going with this, today's talk. Um, our strategy was, you know, how do you find the right behaviors in mice? We started by talking to our clinical friends, the experts in autism, and understanding the real symptoms by watching the kids that they were diagnosing, going to their seminars, listening to them, and then showing them what mice do and saying which of these behaviors, which social behaviors, which repetitive behaviors in mice look similar enough to the symptoms of autism that you would consider them as worthy to use in our models. And so we then get these mice from our collaborators who've made them and our lab does the behavioral testing across ages and works with other labs on the biology and eventually uh, when we've got good ones, you test potential treatment interventions. So here's what mice do. They follow each other around. They do a lot of nose-to-nose -nose sniffing, might be sort of a greeting. They do nose-to-anal genital sniffing that your cats or dogs might do. They sometimes groom each other. Uh, they do a lot of physical contact while they're pushing past each other and crawling and climbing over and under each other. And so what we do is put two mice together in an arena and have a video camera that scores them following each other in physical contact, walking past each other, uh, grooming each other, doing this nose-to-nose -nose sniff. And so we get a picture of how much social interaction is going on during a five or 10 minute interaction session. 
So for example, this is the Shank 3 knockout mouse in which the normal mouse, the wild type litter mate control, does a lot of following and the mutant mouse in uh, stripes is doing much less. And the same for time that they spent sniffing each other and also less social contact in the Shank 3 mutants as compared to their controls. Our lab then went on to develop a simpler automated test to be analogous to the concept that the clinical people explained that children with autism generally will go and play with their own favorite toy rather than engaging in play with other children in the classroom or in the playground. Uh, so we invented this task in 2003. It's now widely used to investigate mouse models of autism by many labs. And basically we give the subject mouse a choice of spending time with a toy. This is a wire cup inverted, held down by a weight in a cup. And mice like to explore that. It's an interesting shape and, and properties. And then on the other side is the same cup as a control, but inside is a novel mouse who the subject has never met before. And most mice will go over and explore both sides, but will spend more time with the novel mouse than with the novel object. So it's a simple yes or no test, takes 10 minutes, easy to automate. We have photo cells between compartments. Every time the mouse goes by, it breaks the beam and the counter counts. Uh, or you could do video tracking uh, systems. And here's this, a strain BTBR that is not social and will walk around and spend time on both sides, but will spend about equal amounts of time on both sides, therefore failing to show sociability. Uh, so here's the B6, more time with the novel mouse in red than with the novel object in green, and the BTBR about equal amounts of time with the novel mouse in red than the novel object in green. We then score the actual interactions to make sure it really is, uh, the subject really is investigating the target mouse. And luckily, the time spent sniffing the novel mouse, which we have to score by hand, correlates very well with the time spent with, in the chamber with the novel mouse, so that that simple automated measure, time in the chamber, is probably a good measure of social interaction and enough to make this a high throughput automated system. Social communication is tougher in mice. Obviously, you can't measure language skills. Mice mostly emit olfactory pheromones. That's how they communicate. And they also emit some vocalizations in the ultrasonic range that we can hear. But we have software to translate it down. This is what we do to measure olfaction. We give olfactory cues soaked on a cotton swab and simply measure the time that the mouse spent sniffing them inanimate kinds of odors like banana or to measure their ability to smell, but then social odors to measure their interest in pheromones from other mice. Then we look at these vocalizations using a special ultrasonic microphone in a soundproof chamber when two mice interacting that we're videotaping. And I wanted to play for you what some of those calls sound like. sound like anything you might have ever heard before? A lot of people are saying birds, and, and I think so too. Um, and we know that birds do use vocalizations for communication. We don't know that yet for mice, and our lab and others are trying to understand whether mice really are communicating information that the other animal responds to, and if so, we'll be able to use that kind of vocalizations as another assay relevant to the social communication problems in autism. And for example, here's the B6 normal mice showing lots of calls during their social interactions, and that BTBR strain that doesn't interact much socially not showing a lot of vocalizations in white. And the Shank 3 mice also lots of vocalizations in the controls and much less in the Shank 3 mutants. So it might be an interesting new uh, avenue to look at communication in mice. Repetitive behaviors are easy. Mice show spontaneous stereotypies. They show a lot of repetitive behaviors such as these. Here's the Shank 3 mice doing a lot of repetitive self-grooming, the normal pattern, but once they get started, it just continues and continues and continues way longer than a normal mouse would continue grooming. Then there's these associated symptoms of autism that the families tell us are very important in terms of the uh, quality of life. And we have behavioral assays in each of these cases to look at these kinds of anxiety-related cognitive skills uh, sleep disruption in mice. So for example, this is the anxiety-related test 
you might want to, th in which the mouse is elevated above, about a meter above, and can either spend time in the closed arms or in the open arms. You might think of this as the George Washington Bridge test for anxiety-related behaviors. And you'd see a normal mouse venturing out into the open arms, but usually quickly going back into the closed arms. An anti-anxiety drug like diazepam, they'd come out into the open arms more. And so these are ways we look at anxiety-like behaviors. We have ways to look at cognitive abilities. This is a touch screen task, very similar to your iPad touch screen, and very similar to the way people are tested for cognitive abilities. The mouse is in this chamber, slightly hungry. We give it a liquid diet reward. It's actually Ensure Strawberry Milkshake. <laughs> if they press the right image on the screen with their nose, and here the airplane would be rewarded, and when they learn to press the airplane for a reward, we say that they've achieved that cognitive skill. And then we can do a reversal in which now the spider is reinforced, and that gives us a measure of cognitive flexibility, which is another way to look at repetitive behaviors. So we've now got these genetic mouse models available. We've got very good assays that are in place, and we're ready to apply these for therapeutic discovery. So how, why? As, as Jerry Fishback was saying, we're thinking about the synapse, why we would focus on a region that's so important uh, that might be amenable to interventions at the synaptic level. And therefore, pharmacological therapeutics might be possible at any age because synapses are forming all the time. You're forming new synapses as we speak right now. And so uh, our lab has been really thinking about this, and here's how it works. Here's the first neuron sending signals across the synapse to the second neuron. And uh, the transmitters sending those signals include glutamate and GABA that Jerry Fishback mentioned are the excitatory and inhibitory transmitters in the brain. And then some of the others, serotonin, dopamine, and oxytocin that uh, Jeremy works with. So these are coming across and turning on the postsynaptic receptor that then sends its signals down, the ax, down to the neuron two through uh, a, a cascade of biochemistry, including some of these uh, phosphatidyl and acetyl 3 kinase, MAP kinases, ERK, P10, tuberous sclerosis gene, mTOR gene. These are the downstream signaling pathways. And luckily, uh, and then we have these other genes, contactin-associated proteins, neurexins and neuroligins that are forming connections between the first and second neuron in terms of the synapses uh, initially forming and strengthening. So the idea is that we have compounds, we have drugs that we already know can intervene at these stages. As Jerry mentioned, Jeremy mentioned, there's the MGLUR5 compounds, there's AMPA and MDA receptor drugs that work through glutamate. We have GABAergic agonists to increase inhibition, as Jerry mentioned, might be the strategy of choice. And then we have serotonin and dopaminergic and oxytocin compounds. And then we have compounds that work through these signaling pathways, ERK inhibitors, for example. And so we have the pharmacological uh, armamentarium to try to pursue and test in these various animal models and see which might reverse the symptoms. And we've had, in fact, some successes so far. This is a paper we published back in 2012 on an mglur R5 antagonist, reversing social deficits and reducing repetitive behaviors in that BTBR model. And this is another paper just out last year on a GABA agonist, R. baclofen, that the Simons Foundation is pursuing further, um, that we found reverses social deficits um, and re repetitive self-grooming. So here's the standard B6 in dark red showing just a little grooming, and the BTBR in dark blue showing a lot of grooming. And increasing treatment with R. baclofen decreased the amount of repetitive self-grooming and also repetitive digging and marble burying. And here's another strain, C8, C58J, that does a lot of stereotyped jumping, vertical jumping, and that was also reduced by an R. baclofen treatment. And similarly, we went on to look at the social behaviors in this line of mice with R. baclofen. And here's in red, the B6 mice showing their normal sociability, more time with the novel object in red than the novel mouse in white. The BTBR failing to show sociability about the same amount of time in blue with the mouse as in white with the object. But our baclofen treatment restoring sociability in the BTBR mice, now showing significantly more time with the novel mouse than the novel object, and significantly more time sniffing the novel mouse than the novel object, 
without having significant effects on general activity, entries back and forth. So it's not just a sedating dose that would be causing these effects. So we're uh, very excited about the possibility of these pharmacological interventions and have started a new consortium in trying to de-risk the development of autism therapeutics and encourage more companies to get into testing compounds in the clinical setting. Uh, we're calling it the Preclinical Autism Consortium for Therapeutics, or PACT, that evaluates multiple drug treatments, hypothesis-driven, as Allison said, evidence-based, with high preclinical reproducibility, doing the same replications a few times to be sure we're right, uh, using both mice and rats, two different species, and using a series of behavioral assays replicated in two cohorts, and then our collaborator Mustafa Sahin doing physiology, EEGs, and uh, sleep circadian disruptions in two cohorts. And this is a project sp sponsored by Autism Speaks, supported by Autism Speaks, uh, and it's uh, multi-site investigators, our lab at the Mind Institute in Sacramento. Mustafa Sahin is at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard, and Carrie Jones at Vanderbilt is looking at the same mutations in rats. And uh, Dan Smith and now Paul Wang is leading the uh, program forward through the uh, Autism Speak side. And we're now beginning to partner with companies to try to test the compounds that we think might be most interesting in terms of pharmacological targets to pursue first in the mouse and rat models, and hopefully, if they're successful, then move forward into clinical trials. And we have a very distinguished scientific advisory board who's been giving us tremendous advice about which types of compounds might be the right choices, including Jeremy, whose uh, insights we've tremendously appreciated. So we're extremely grateful for the support we've gotten, uh, including the Simons Foundation, uh, who supported some of our work on the 16P mice. And I uh, want to mention all the terrific people in our lab who've contributed to these experiments. And, uh, just finish up by saying that at this point, we're cautiously optimistic that pharmacological targets discovered using genetic mouse models, perhaps combined with behavioral interventions, which are currently the standard of care in autism, will yield effective medical treatments for the diagnostic symptoms of autism. Thank you.